our first workshop will be presented by Laura Lyman. Uh, Laura is an instructor of mathematics, statistics, and computer science at McAllister College. And in her research, she studies how uncertainty propagates through models in science and engineering using spectral methods. And prior to her current role, Laura completed her PhD at Stanford University in the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering. Laura will present the workshop Introduction to Linear Regression. Please welcome Laura. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Now, linear regression is a fundamental tool used in statistics and data science for modeling the relationship between different parameters of interest that arise in our data sets. It can be used for prediction, forecasting, error reduction, so many different avenues, and the number of applications feel, feel sort of endless. But let's take it a step back. In this workshop, we're gonna introduce the theoretical underpinnings of simple linear regression so that you can understand how and why this fundamental tool works the way it does. So I'll teach it as if you are sitting in a classroom, I will be taking, uh, I'll be writing on an iPad specifically, and I encourage you to write along with me. All right, like I said, I encourage you to write along with me and by writing out all of these notes, I hope that the pace will be sort of reasonable and uh, tractable. Now, let's say you have two quantitative variables. And what do I mean by quantitative? I mean that they have numeric values and units with those values. So uh, length measured in uh, kilometers, for example, would be an example of a quantitative variable. And I'll label these two quantitative variables, capital X and capital Y. And we're trying to explore a relationship. between these variables. So specifically, let's label them. I'm going to call X our explanatory. Or predictor variable. And I'll refer to Y as our outcome or response variable. Now, in practice, how do you know uh, which variables are explanatory or which ones are the response? Well, you don't. You ultimately have to uh, decide based on the context of the problem that you're examining uh, rather than sort of mathematically assigning a label to one or another. So ultimately, based on the context of your problem, you're going to suspect maybe that one variable has a causal effect on another. So if we have two explanatory, if we have two rather quantitative variables, a good first start is to create something like a scatter plot. So here, for example, on the x-axis, let's say it's the uh, number of years that you been learning statistics. And on the y-axis, it could be some sort of metric for your interest in taking this workshop. And we plot our data and we hope to see a relationship. And ultimately, oops, sorry. Ultimately, if we're lucky, we'll observe something that is linear in fashion. between our model variables. And if that's the case, if we observe a roughly linear relationship, 
we can assume a linear model of the following form. So I'll write out the equation and then I'll go through what exactly I mean by all of the notation. Okay, so what's happening here? This uh, bolded E is the expected value. which you can think of as an average. Specifically, it's the expected value of our response Y given the predictor capital X. So how do we read this sentence? We would say the expected value of Y given the explanatory X is beta zero plus beta one times X. So what are these coefficients over here? Well, ultimately we're trying to assume that the relationship between Y and X, at least in an average sense, follows that of a line. So specifically, we have that beta naught, some, some number is our intercept. Beta one, that coefficient corresponds to a slope. And our capital X is the variable. So specifically, let's try to match up notation. So if you remember from, say, uh, high school algebra, you might write down something like y equals m times x, where m is a slope, it's a rise over run, and b is our intercept or what y equals when x is zero. So let's sort of match up uh, linear regression, this sort of analog of y equals mx plus b. So specifically, the b becomes the beta naught, the m becomes the beta one, our input, Say for high school is going to be a lowercase x. For a linear model, our input, our input is the explanatory capital X. For a regular line, our output is a lowercase y. And for the linear model, we instead replace the lowercase y with this bold face e and y, capital Y specifically given our explanatory X. Perfect. So how do we know exactly what beta zero and beta one is equal? Well, ultimately, beta zero and beta one should be chosen to produce a so-called line of best fit. Uh, 
And we'll go into what exactly that means. And even so, when we select our beta zero and beta one to be a line of best fit, we should note that whatever estimates we have for these value are based on the data we have. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean specifically that So these values change if we add or remove data points. So we can imagine, say we go back to a line like this, that for now, just taking as a given that we have perhaps some way to find a line of best fit. Let's say it looks like that. But ultimately, let's say we had a smaller data set in the beginning. Perhaps just a couple points. Well, and then in this dramatic example, our line of best fit would look totally different. So what do I mean by all of this? I mean to say that when we're looking at a linear model, the best we can do is estimate the values of beta zero and beta one based on the data that we have. But ultimately, whatever we determine based on our data set isn't necessarily the true beta zero or beta one that would best represent this linear model. So accordingly, let's introduce some notation. I'll say that beta zero hat is going to be the estimated intercept based on our data. So this would be heuristically uh, what a computer spits out or returns. And our beta one would be the estimated slope based on our data. So accordingly, if we let the blue dots here be our data points and the red is our line of best fit, which is also called the regression line, or a linear model. Accordingly, we can write out the equation for the regression line shown in red as follows. So on the left-hand side, we have y hat, which is going to be the predicted value of the response y. 
And on the right hand side, we have beta zero hat plus beta one. I'll call it X. And this little X is an actual uh, data point or observation. for the predictor capital X. So let's pause for a second because this seems very similar to the model equation that we had before. And the difference is this, the model equation, if I go back, the model equation is representing the relationship as a whole between our response y and our predictor x. And the beta zero and the beta one here are considered uh, true or theoretical values in some sense. We're not actually estimating them. Versus the regression line, which is closely related. The regression line is literally the equation for our line of best fit here in red. And it involves actual um, estimates that we derive from the data and specific predictions. So you can think of the regression line as an actualization of the linear model overall. Okay, so let's now talk about how exactly we find this line of best fit. So suppose we label the i data point x sub i, y sub i. The regression line predicts that y sub i will be the following. But we saw how the regression line didn't go through every data point. We can see this here ultimately, that while the red line represents a general trend, it's not actually going to intersect every single blue observation here. So we can then look at the difference between the actual data points and the predicted value of the response based on the regression line. And this vertical distance is called a vertical residual for the i data point. And you can also call this difference the absolute error in the i data point. I.e., how wrong our model was given the observation xi, yi. So specifically, 
or highlight this. We can have a pretty clear understanding of what it means for the regression line to be off or incorrect for a single data point, because we can look at that vertical residual or that measurement of error for that point. But then you might wonder, how do we collectively summarize the error in all of these data points? Well, to do that, we need to introduce some vector notation. I'll put that there. And you can look at that just sort of as a, as a reminder for some of the notation. So the equation of the regression line, again, is y hat is beta dot hat plus beta one hat times our input x. Now, we can put our response data or all of the values of y into a vector, which you can think of as a list. If you're less aware with linear algebra. So it's a very special type of list that allows operations between lists of its type. So specifically, I can make a list of all of our observed value of y, where capital N is the number of data points. And similarly, we can do the same with our predicted values of y. So it's a little funny, the notation here, it's a y hat, so our predictions based on our regression line, and I'm adding a vector to it. So these are all of the predictions of our uh, linear regression model. So returning to the picture, we're making one list of all of the y values of our data points. And we're making another list of all of the y values that were predicted by the regression line. And we're putting those into lists or into vectors so that we can collectively compare them and understand the difference between them or the error. Now, from here, we can do the following. We can define the error or residual vector I'll call it E as the difference between all of the actual observations for our response variable capital Y and the values of Y that were predicted from linear regression. We can look at the difference between those two vectors and I'll write out what that means exactly. So 
So we can think of this now as a list, not only of the response variable, not only of the predicted values, but as a list of all of those differences. So this error vector is a list containing all of these little uh, green values that we would get. This one, this one, this one, et cetera. All of those vertical residuals. So we have an error vector, but we might then wonder, okay, we have all the information, all of these differences, but how do we measure the size of this vector? How do we decide how to get an actual uh, scalar quantitative value at the end of the day that represents, you know, the error is 0.5, the error is 0.01. We want some number that we can look at that gives us a sense of the size of this vector. And we might wonder how to do that, but ultimately, we can look at the residual with the Pythagorean theorem. But ultimately, even though what we'll uh, demonstrate here is sort of the standard way of determining the size of a vector, there are several ways to measure the size of our error vector B. And ultimately, the way in which we pick or measure the size of our error vector E is going to produce different estimates of our data. Because ultimately, we somehow want the line of best fit to minimize the size of all of the residual error vectors. But there's sometimes not a, a clear way to do that necessarily. We might not know exactly which which line to pick, they all, seem, they all seem okay. And the punchline is that depending on how we decide to measure the size of our error vector, we'll get different lines of best fit. Now, before I mentioned the Pythagorean theorem, so I'll back that up by saying this is the standard way or the ordinary least squares way, that's also a buzzword, of measuring the error vector we have. So let me pull up a diagram of a triangle here. Now, if we just think of a vector of only two elements in it, let's call this vector v1, v2. And for a moment, we're taking a step back from this workshop. We're just trying to think of high school algebra. Now, we can represent this vector v1, v2 as the following red line. And 
Uh, before, we would measure the size of the sector or the length by using the Pythagorean theorem to say that the length was a squared plus b squared, or in this case, v1 squared plus v2 squared. So I'll write that out. The length of this vector, v hat, or rather v uh, with the vector sign, is the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared. And this concept generalizes in the following way. So ultimately, a convenient way to measure the size of a vector of length n, which applies to our residual uh, error vector from before, from all capital N data points. Oops. One way to measure the size is to generalize this idea of the Pythagorean theorem and say that the length or size of V1 could be capital N is instead the sum of all of the components squared. So we're taking the same idea as what we did when we had a vector just of size two, just two elements, and we're generalizing to a vector of length capital N. And we're saying that this quantity at the end of the day measures the size of this vector with n elements or components of it. So if we return to linear regression, we can now formalize what it means to have a line of best fit. So we can say the best fit line should minimize the size of E, which is the sum of all of its components squared. Plugging in Oops. the sum of all of those differences or vertical residuals each squared. Now that we have a formal way of looking at the residual, we can say with mathematical specificity, the line of best fit minimizes And the sigma means a uh, summation okay and you might have noticed that i dropped the square root that was present over here but the idea behind that is that the line of best fit that minimizes the square root 
will also minimize the squared sum. So essentially, by minimizing one of those quantities, you're guaranteed to minimize the other. So what is all of this building to do? This is called the sum of squared residuals. And it's minimized by the line of best fit. And anytime you read sort of introductory statistics literature, it'll talk about minimizing the sum squared residuals, but this is where that comes from. Ultimately, the reason that we care about this particular sum is that it represents the size of the error between what we get from our prediction, which is represented by the red line, the error between that and the actual observations or through the blue data points that we see. Okay. So now that we have gone over the reason why linear regression oops, minimizes this sum of squared residuals. Let's sort of summarize what we've done, and then I'll describe how we can start constructing simple linear regression when one of our predictor variables isn't quantitative, so to speak. But first, let's summarize what we did. So the essential takeaways from this are the following facts. Linear regression picks the line, that is, chooses beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat And therefore, the predicted y i hat linear regression picks the line that has the smallest sum of squared residuals. So this is what a program like R is doing behind the scenes. When you fit a linear uh, regression model to your data, it's essentially uh, solving this minimization problem, which can be done with uh, calculus and a lot of different uh, numerical techniques as well. Okay. That's takeaway number one. And then takeaway number two is the sum of squared residuals. is a standard measure of error in our regression model. It's not the only way, uh, it's not the only standard of measure of, of error. It's not the only standard measure. It's not the only measure of error. It's a standard that's used, but there are other ways to define error that ultimately uh, are derived from different ways to look at the size of your uh, residual vector E. Okay. So now I'll briefly within the next four minutes or so, 
I'll briefly introduce what we do with categorical variables as predictors. So what is a categorical variable? So a predictor or any variable is categorical if its values are categories or labels. So that might not be a very helpful definition until you actually have examples. So uh, for example, if you look at the um, called spatial key housing data and it's available freely as a package in R and I believe it's called Sacramento. So I can provide this data set afterwards, but a publicly available uh, data set on housing that has one variable that's described as type. And what is type? Type is the type of property that the category is residential, multifamily, and condo. So we have a variable, in this case type for this example, that is coded as having one of three categories. So you have a data point, and if it's condo, it's labeled as condo or the type variable. And we see this type of variable a lot in different data sets because not everything necessarily has an associated quantitative value that we assign units to. Like we, we don't have uh, a specific number or units associated with whether a property is a condo or not. So what do we do? How do we incorporate this into linear regression? Ultimately, and this could easily go into a two-part video, but ultimately, we use something called indicator variables, which are essentially used to transform categorical variables into numeric values. So let me continue with this example. Let's say within this data set, we also have some other variables. I'll call them price, type, and area. Let's say we wanted to model price as a function of type, right? We want to ultimately look at how the price of a property is going to uh, vary with uh, its property type. So whether it's um, like a condo or a multifamily home. And if we did our regular linear regression, in this case, capital Y is price. And capital X is type. Well, we couldn't do something like this. We couldn't do something like this because there's no well-defined way to have multiplication between a categorical variable on its own and some quantitative slope. Like what does it mean to be five times a condo or four times a residential property? It's not, it's, it's not clear. 
So we can't just use the linear regression model that we did before when our predictor capital X was quantitative. So what do we do instead? Instead, we introduce indicator variables for everyone, for uh, all of the categories. So in particular, type was coded as condo, multifamily, which I'll abbreviate as MF, and residential. Ultimately, instead introduce variables. In this case, I call them is condo or is residential, which are indicators, where is condo is one if the data point has type equal to condo and zero if not. Okay. And there's a rich number of resources available for uh, then introducing you as to why exactly we use these uh, specific indicators and how they work as they do. But the high level description is this, given a uh, categorical variable, we use these indicators, we use these variables of just ones and zeros to represent our input in the linear model in a way such that we have quantitative numbers that have well-defined multiplication between them. So ultimately is condo, is it just a one or a zero? And we can multiply one and zero by this coefficient beta one. And is residential, which would be defined similarly as an indicator with just ones and zeros, that has multiplication with the coefficient like beta two. So ultimately, linear regression can be extended to incorporate all types of variables as the predictors. And with that, since we have roughly 11 minutes uh, left, I'll pause here and invite questions in the chat and I will do my best to address them. But ultimately what we've learned from all of this is that linear regression, which is, like a, fun, which is a fundamental tool used in uh, statistics and data science, comes from ultimately choosing a line of best fit. That line of best fit is selected based on a certain criteria for measuring error. And we can extend linear regression to incorporate all types of variables that we see in the real world, whether or not they have units associated with them. And now that you have had a small snippet of this enormous subject, I hope that you can use that curiosity to go into the world and learn more about it. So I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. That was a really great workshop, um, really great foundation for linear regression. And we have some really good questions in the chat. So I definitely encourage anyone else who has questions to post them. And we'll start going through some of them. Um, Perfect. So one question here is someone's asking for you to elaborate on why the expected value of y given x equals beta zero plus beta one times x. Um, they're basically wondering like if x is fixed, like are beta zero and beta one also fixed or, or, um, or do they have their own distributions with their own expected values? Oh, oh, I see, I see. So um, ultimately, uh, right, when I'm describing the linear model and talking about specific points, Ultimately, for the uh, model equation itself, 
this capital X, hard to distinguish the capital of the lowercase, <laughs> this capital X means uh, any potential uh, input or data point. So if you have uh, some probability background, um, this capital X would have its own distribution of values. And based on that distribution, or specifically that distribution then informs the data points that we see. So the data points would be lowercase x and uh, the input variable capital X. So the data points are realizations of our input variable capital X and using all of those uh, potential data points, we then select our estimates of beta zero and beta one hat. But in the regression equation itself, in this model equation, uh, we think of typically the beta zero and the beta one as uh, being fixed. Now, of course, if we're looking at this sort of probabilistically in terms of distributions, that's not true. But uh, for simple linear regression, we're ultimately finding uh, fixed values of beta zero and beta one that best represent the relationship between capital X and capital Y. So hopefully that, that addresses some of the, the confusion. Yeah, I think that was a great, great question. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. So yeah, no, excellent question. I love questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so someone else is asking, um, they're thinking back to when there was a jump where you wrote the two different points and you could fit mm -hmm. an exact line through there and then you jumped yeah. to end points. So they asked, would, would it be possible to draw, draw out a couple of triangles on the graph? I'm, I think they might be wondering if you only had, if you jump from two to three points, oh. like how does the line change? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, right. So for two data points. We, of course, have just this triangle, but I'll do my best to draw something in 3D. So let's say we have something like this. We have a specific point in 3D. And let's say that point has values uh, here, I'll keep it consistent, V1, V2, V3. So then, we have some kind of line from the uh, origin up to that point. And ultimately, it's kind of like we're looking at the projection or the shadow of this vector in terms of uh, understanding its uh, size. So if this is V1, V2, V3, so we would have V1 squared would be something like this. And then V2 squared, it's hard because I kind of made it like uh, <laughs> on the axis sort of, sort of like zero, but you know, V3 squared would be something like that. But ultimately, you can uh, picture in 3D that you're uh, taking all of the components and you're summing the uh, squared values of them. So something like that. OK, perfect. Yeah, I think that was great clarification as well. Um, and then we have two more questions kind of related to actually the residuals and everything. Yeah. So um, one person asked, are the vertical residuals the absolute values when you're talking about residuals? Yes. The absolute values? Yes, 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 exactly. That is a wonderful clarification. So ultimately, uh, when I'm talking about these residuals, yeah, ultimately the residual is uh, the absolute value. And sometimes people kind of gloss over the difference when they know that they're doing a sum of squares, since the square will take care of the uh, sign of this difference, but yes, excellent clarification. It should be uh, the absolute value. Okay, great. And I think that answers also a question someone asked, do we need to take the absolute values for the components in the error vector? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and when I uh, sort of mentioned uh, different ways to measure the uh, size of the error vector, an alternative is that instead of uh, summing up the squares, 
of these absolute values of differences, you can just sum up the uh, absolute values themselves. And that's a different type of uh, vector norm and ultimately a, a different way to measure the size of the error vector and it would give you a, a different line. Okay, great. And someone else is asking, is there a limit to the number of categorical labels that you can have in a linear, linear regression model? So for example, if you have 10 yeah. categorical labels um, and the categorical label has around 10 categorical values and the dependent value is numeric, can you deal yeah, with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, I'm, I'm laughing because uh, some of my students, yeah, I mean, you, you see this all the time, right? You, you have a, a categorical variable with like, 12 categories. And so ultimately, there is not a limit. You can keep on adding those puppies, so to speak, to your uh, regression equation. You can keep tacking them on here. It would be beta 3 plus beta 4. Um, ultimately, the number of indicators is one less than the number of uh, total categories because the intercept uh, sort of implicitly includes a category. But uh, to answer the question more directly, there, there is a uh, not a limit as long as there's a finite number of, of categories. Um, the finiteness is why we can't, uh, say, take a quantitative variable and make it uh, categorical for in the set. We can make it categorical, but we couldn't have a single category for like every single value of the, the quantitative variable. Like we couldn't have a category of one and 1.1 and 1.2 and everything in between. So no limit uh, as long as it's it's finite. Okay, great. That makes a lot of sense. And then another question we have here is, is linear regression a mathematical tool that could form association and prediction formulas for all kinds of relationships between two items? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the only uh, kind of limitation I would say is that ultimately this model is assuming a linear relationship. So it can, it can be applied to any type of uh, data points, but it might not necessarily give you a super accurate prediction. So here, let me give an example. Let's say your data points are, I don't know. Well, they can't cross back like that, but <laughs> let's say you have something where this is uh, supposed to kind of encode like a, a quadratic relationship. Now, your line of best fit, it does, it's, it tries its hardest, but ultimately the, li the line that minimizes the error still might have a lot of error. So the minimum uh, error for your regression line might still not really represent the data. So ultimately, uh, while you can apply this model for relationships that are nonlinear or uh, that might be better sort of described by, uh, I don't know, some type of polynomial fitting. Well, you can apply this, it might not be the best idea. Okay, great. Um, I think that those are all the questions we have time for. You have a few more clarifications in the Q&A, which you're free to type responses to. Um, but thank you so much for this presentation. This was really great. Yeah, thank you so much here. I will stop uh, sharing my screen. And yeah, I appreciate the questions and the engagement.